Hello and welcome to our service. It's great to have you with us as we worship God together. We'll be hearing from God's word, praying to our Heavenly Father and singing some beautiful hymns. Savior, live in me from day to day. By his love and power controlling all I do and say. May the word of God dwell richly in my heart from hour to hour, so that all may see I triumph only through his power. May the peace of God, my Father, rule my life in everything that I may become to comfort sick and sorrowing. May Now let's talk to God with a prayer of confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbours as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbours and to live for your honour and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear now the words of assurance. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our God. I'd like to bring you our Bible reading for today. The reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 to 23. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. 
Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. It's great to have you today. Part of this message is about traditions. Why do we do the things we do? Sometimes we do them because we've always done them the same way and we never question the reason. In fact, one of my greatest memories growing up is Saturday mornings. My dad would cook breakfast, but in a specific and routine way. He would do scrambled eggs and bacon and toast, but before serving, he'd cut them all up into small pieces and mix them all together. Later in life, I asked my dad why he mixed up his eggs and bacon and toast like that. And he said he did it because his dad did it. And I asked, well, why did your dad do it that way? And my dad said, well, because he didn't have any teeth. So that's why I still mix up my eggs and bacon and toast. It's a family tradition. In our passage today, we're going to see where Jesus tangled with some Jewish leaders who cherished tradition more than the word of God. The Jews were very meticulous about obeying the multitude of laws in the Old Testament. The kosher laws had to do with the things that were clean and unclean. Some food was kosher, but certain foods weren't kosher, and the Jews believed if they ate them, they'd be defiled. I wouldn't be a good Jew because they can't eat lobster and prawns and pork. But you might be surprised to learn that grasshoppers, crickets and locusts are considered kosher. Jesus' disciples weren't eating with dirty hands. So folks, you still need to wash your hands before you eat. They were actually criticised because they didn't follow the ceremonial hand-washing ritual the Jews practised. So let's learn four important truths. The first one is there is danger replacing God's truth with man's traditions. Jesus turned the Jews' criticism into an opportunity to warn them that they had elevated the traditions of man above the word of God. He pointed out a religious and legal loophole the Jews had created called Korban. The Ten Commandments taught that we must honour our fathers and mothers. And that means as long as our parents are alive, we're to honour them and to take care of them. But the Jewish mafia created this loophole by which a Jewish man could say, oh, I'm devoting all my assets to the temple. 
and he made a small down payment to the priest. And then he continued to live on his income. And if his elderly parents came up and said, son, we need some financial help, he could say, oh, sorry, mum and dad, all my money is devoted to the temple. And Jesus said this tradition made a mockery of the word of God. He said, thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do many things like that. And the Jews had many more of these tedious oral laws. For instance, if a Jewish man was carrying a pot and it was touched by a Gentile, that pot had to be broken into pieces and the largest piece of broken pottery couldn't be any larger than a man's big toe. Can't you just see a Pharisee breaking a pot and then holding the broken pieces next to his big toe to make sure he pleased God? Now, we've always fought the tendency to create traditions, whether it's dressing up for church, how often we conduct communion in our services, and even certain things we do religiously in our personal lives that may add to what God expects of us. And this can be dangerous, as Jesus points out. Secondly, religious practices will never make us acceptable to God. The reason we like traditions, whether it's washing your hands, dressing up for church, is that it's something we can do outwardly and actually feel good about ourselves. Jesus taught that righteousness wasn't a matter of outward religious practice, that it's a matter of inward affection towards God. Jesus called the Jews hypocrites. They honoured God with their lips, but their hearts were far from God. The word hypocrite comes from a word that meant an actor. A hypocrite is someone whose walk doesn't match his talk. A few years ago, Nike produced a commercial you might not remember because although they spent a huge amount of money producing it, the commercial only ran for a few days. The commercial was filmed in Africa and a group of Zulu warriors were wearing Nike basketball shoes as they were jumping around. And these Zulus had an amazing vertical leap. Rock music played as they jumped in these shoes and then the camera focused on one of the warriors who said something in his Bantu dialect, Nike Buka Buka Buka. And the words that came up on the screen for the translation had him saying, Nike, just do it. You may wonder, well, what's wrong with that? Well, after the commercial had aired a few times, a college professor who spoke Bantu called Nike and informed them that what the Zulu warrior actually said was, these Nike shoes hurt my feet. <laughs> the message Nike wanted to get out didn't match what the man was saying. The problem with religion is that it is man's attempt to earn God's acceptance by following a prescribed set of rules and regulations. God gave the Old Testament law to actually show to us that none of us can obey his rules. Here's how the Bible describes the law. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Romans chapter 3, 19 and 20. So how many people will be declared righteous by performing religious acts? Zero. How many mouths will be able to give an ex excuse for their behavior? Zero. How many of us will be held accountable to God? All of us. So with this truth, Jesus moves on to address the true nature of sin and righteousness. And it has nothing to do with the way you wash your hands or whether you eat fish or not. Thirdly, we sin because we're born with a bad heart. The Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond all cure. Who can understand it, says Jeremiah in 17.9. There are two basic schools of thought about human goodness and evil. A humanist says all people are basically good at heart, but because of a lack of education or poverty or poor environment or association with bad people, a person gradually falls into evil. 
The other position is that man is basically born with a sinful nature and must be redeemed by Jesus Christ. And, of course, that's the position the Bible teaches. We're not good people becoming bad. In fact, we're bad to the bone. The English playwright and comedian Noel Coward once played a practical joke. He sent an anonymous letter to 10 of the most influential people in London. And the letter said, we all know what you have done. If you don't want to be exposed, leave town. Of course, it was just a joke, but Noel Coward said that all 10 individuals moved within six months. If we could dig into each of our lives, we'd see the evidence that we're all sinners. Jesus used this occasion about clean and unclean traditions to teach us the source of human sin. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. And after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart but into his stomach and then out of his body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Now he went on. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside, making a man unclean. Fourthly, salvation involves getting a new heart. And that's the bad news. But it's only the bad news that makes the good news so good. If I said to you, your house isn't on fire, you'd probably look at me like I was crazy. But what if I said, I saw smoke in your neighbourhood and saw a fire truck speeding down your street, but your house isn't on fire, you'd say, whew, that's good news. The bad news is that we're all sinners bound for hell. The good news is that Jesus died on the cross so that we could receive a spiritual heart transplant. God doesn't want to patch up your old heart. He wants to give you a new one. God spoke through the prophet Ezekiel to show us that sinful humanity's only hope is to get a new heart. God promises, I'll give you a new heart, says the message version. Put a new spirit in you. I'll remove the stone heart from your body and replace it with a heart that's God-willed, not self-willed. Jesus told the hyper-religious Pharisee Nicodemus that he would never be good enough to see the kingdom of heaven. He said, you must be born again. And when you are born again spiritually, God gives you a new start on life. And it includes a new heart. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Would you like a new heart today? Jesus has a heart full of grace and forgiveness, and he offers to become a permanent resident in your heart. Salvation isn't a matter of your head. You can't think your way into heaven. Salvation isn't a matter of your hands. You you can't work your way into heaven. It's a matter of the heart. And God is offering you salvation, which is a free gift. But it's not cheap. In fact, it costs Jesus everything. In John 19, we read that as Jesus was dying on the cross, a Roman soldier pierced his side with a spear and water and blood flowed out from the wound of Jesus. That indicated that the literal heart of Jesus had burst. He died of a broken heart so we can have a new heart. The old hymn says, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The third verse goes, Dear dying lamb, 
thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. May this minister to you today. Let's pray. We thank you, our God, that you have paid the ultimate price for us and you call us to yourself. Help us to surrender our sinful ways and may we follow you with a new contrite heart, one that has come from you through forgiveness and through the death of Jesus on the cross. For those who don't know you, may we give our hearts to you that we might receive your new life into our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful day. Let's talk to God now in prayer. Psalm 33 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Heavenly Father, we worship you today. Thank you for your power and magnificence that is displayed throughout creation. May your glory continue to be declared and known throughout the earth. Thank you that when you speak, we can trust in what you say. Your promises are sure, and you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen. Lord and Heavenly Father, the strengthener of those who suffer in body, mind, and soul, Lay your healing hands on those who are sick, that they may be restored to health and show their thankfulness in love to you and service to their neighbour. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty Father, in your love and wisdom, you know the anxieties and fears of your children. Grant that they may be enabled to cast all their cares on you, for you love them. Give them quietness of mind and unshaken trust in you and guide their feet into the way of peace 
Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing together now a beautiful hymn. have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, Sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of all before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Like the glory of the morning on the wave He is wisdom to the mighty He is succor to the brave So the world shall be his footstool And the soul of time his slave Our God is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Thanks so much for watching. Let's conclude our service with the benediction. Father, take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.